You will recall that Paul has devoted most of this epistle to exhorting the Corinthians to grow up and quit acting like selfish little babies that are fighting all the time. That's it in a nutshell. And as you look back over the course of the epistle, you will see that, that he is exposing their selfishness, their self-will. They were arrogant, opinionated, divisive, cliquish. They were litigious, they were worldly, immoral, they were unloving in many cases. And a lot of them were what we might call self-exalting, charismatic show-offs with their spiritual gifts. Some had even gotten sucked into the lie that resurrection is not really going to happen. And frankly, in many ways, these early saints can depict any one of us at any given time. So let's don't look at them as if they are beneath us because some of these things describe us here at Calvary Bible Church as well. So it's not surprising, given all, of, given all of this, that the Apostle Paul comes to the close of this letter instructing the saints in that church, which was predominantly Gentile, concerning the collection for the predominantly Jewish saints that were in Jerusalem who were in great financial distress. Sadly, self-centered, self-centered Christians tend to invest only in themselves, not in the kingdom of God. They see no needs beyond their own. And certainly in the first century, if you're a Gentile, the last thing you want to do is give money to help a bunch of Jews in Jerusalem. That was what he was having to deal with. But Paul calls them to do just that. Here's an opportunity, you might say, to grow up. An opportunity to present yourself as a living and a holy sacrifice which is acceptable to the Lord. So let me read these first four verses. And then we will unpack them. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. When I arrive, whomever you may approve, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. Now, I want us to look at this under two very simple headings. We're going to see, number one, the need. I want to explain that to you. And then, number two, the exhortation. And then I wish to expand upon these themes by briefly examining some other passages that give us some very basic categories for princip- or principles for Christian giving. I should say categories of principles for Christian giving now, that I trust will be an encouragement to you. Because remember, God has promised to bless those who are obedient to his principles for financially giving. Now, Many people are ignorant about these matters. I've run across this many times. Many are indifferent, and then a lot are just downright selfish. And thereby, they forfeit God's blessing in their life. And so you want to examine yourself in light of what God has to tell us. And frankly, a quick look at your checkbook will tell you all you need to know about your priorities. Many are confused about how much to give. There are those that say, well, you need to tithe 10%. And then some will argue, well, yeah, but that's of net. And others will say, well, no, that's of gross. Well, so how much does God require? And many times when people ask that, they're saying to themselves, how little can I give and still get away with it? And many have had bad experiences in churches there are churches where the, the, the leadership is absolutely preoccupied with money. 
And so you're always hearing these pleas, these appeals for more money, all the gimmicks, all of the fundraising projects, and then gra always bragging about how much money they brought in with certain projects that they participated in. And then there are others that turn the church into a business venture where everything is about making money. And typically they find ways to offer services to take people's money. And then there are those that measure the success of a church based upon its wealth, how much money it's taking in. If it's taking in good money, then God is being honored. If not, then mm, God is being dishonored. And as we will see biblically, quite the opposite is true. And some churches will show partiality to the rich. They will offer them honored positions and allow them uh, to really dictate policy and often doctrine and so forth. So we want to be guarded against all of those kinds of things and just look and see what God has to say about principles of giving because our desire is to honor Him and in turn He has promised to bless us with every spiritual blessing. So first of all, let me explain to you the need the context here, the, the issues that are, were, were going on in the first century that warranted this collection. You see, Jewish believers in Jerusalem were living in poverty. They were suffering severely. And like all large cities in the ancient world, Jerusalem was overpopulated. It did not have the resources to properly care for people. So poverty was the rule, not the accept, exception. And we know, according to Acts eleven twenty eight, 28, that there had been a severe famine a few years earlier. In Acts 2, we also know that many Jewish converts were pilgrims who had come to Jerusalem, and they had participated in and uh, the, the, the feasts and festivals, and all of a sudden they hear Peter and the guys, and they come to faith in Christ, and now they stay. I mean, this is incredible. They understand the gospel. In Acts 2, we know that they witnessed many signs and wonders through the apostles. The text says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and on and on it goes. So now you have all of these pilgrims that are that are hanging out there. And then in Acts 4, we know that a lot of the, the new believers there sold their land and their houses, and they, they brought the proceeds to the apostles to distribute to each other. But of course, those resources wouldn't last very long, and they didn't. Most Jewish converts that lived there were experiencing grace persecution from their families. Many of them had been kicked out of their homes. Their families kept their possessions, we know. And so imagine if all of a sudden you're homeless and you're trying to find a spot to live over at my place and we've got a barn and we're trying to help you out. And I mean, that's the type of thing that was going on. They had been disqualified from the welfare system of the synagogue. They had been desynagogued. Some of them had been put in prison and and in many cases, we know that the only jobs that they could perform were the most menial tasks. So the situation was dire. So we know that Paul has been urging all of the Gentile churches to help. And he's been doing this now for over a year. And what he's going to do then is collect the money from all of these churches during his third missionary journey and ultimately take it to these suffering saints in Jerusalem. But Paul also knew that this collection would serve another very important purpose, and that would be the purpose of unifying the body, Jews and Gentiles. There had been generations of hatred between Jews and Gentiles. And he wanted to demonstrate to them in a very tangible, concrete way how the gospel had finally torn down this, this wall of division between them. Now, this would be real hard for Gentiles because they had no use for the Jews who considered them to be lower than dogs. And they had heard this all of their life, right? 
but they needed to appreciate their indebtedness to the Jews. And Paul makes this very clear in Romans 15, verse 26, he says, For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so, and they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. We know that Jesus even said in John 4, verse 22, that salvation is from the Jews. We know in Romans 11, you read that whole chapter and you see how Paul is reminding the Gentiles there that, that they are indebted to the Jews because they have been grafted into the root of Abrahamic covenantal blessing. Verse 18 of Romans 11, don't be arrogant, he says. Remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. So it would have been hard for the Gentiles, but it was also really hard for the Jews to accept charity from people that they considered beneath them. And so this is the dynamics. This is the need. So he says in verse 1, now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. Notice he says, the collection. This is a reference to a specific collection for the Jewish saints in Jerusalem, according to verse 3. It would have been one that they were already aware of. So that's the need. Now let's look secondly at the exhortation. It begins in verse 2. He says, on the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper so that no collections be made when I come. By the way, this is another indication in Scripture that the saints uh, met together on the first day of the week. They worshiped the Lord on Sundays. The Sabbath had been set aside. Uh, the resurrection day had taken the priority. Remember now, the, the Sabbath was a sign of the Mosaic Covenant, but Christians are now under the New Covenant, and there is not a single New Testament command to keep the Sabbath. In fact, the New Testament explicitly teaches that Sabbath keeping was not a requirement. Romans 14.5, Galatians 4.10, verse 11, and Colossians 2.15-17. We know according to Acts 20 and verse 7 that it was the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. And we know that the church then gathered there with them to worship. If you look at uh, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, you see that the first day of the week is referred to as the Lord's Day. And that's how we often refer to it. This is the Lord's Day. And the writings of the early church fathers confirm that... This was the practice as well. So, he says, on the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save so that no collections be made when I come. And the exhortation continues in verse 3. When I arrive, whomever you may approve, I will send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. By the way, th this is not only uh, a way of providing accountability, for the funds that were going to be collected so that nobody could say, well, yeah, Paul ran off with the funds. But it also provides personal contact. It also provides fellowship between the two churches with such different ethnic backgrounds. I mean, this was a way of strengthening the the fraternal oneness between the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, imagine what it would be like for for you as a Jewish person, you'd come to saving faith, and now all of a sudden here comes these, these Corinthian Greeks that had come to faith in Christ. These people that before you'd never even touch. You wouldn't let them in your house. You wouldn't touch something that they had eaten from. And now all of a sudden they come with a letter, and they come with all of these gifts for you. Imagine what that would do. And so that's the dynamics here. By the way, Paul often used the term koinonia, the translated fellowship, uh, in reference to, to offerings. Now, from this exhortation, combined with others in the New Testament, some of which we will look at, God gives us some very clear principles uh, for Christian giving, for our financial stewardship. 
of all that God has entrusted to us. And by the way, you just want to remember that everything you have belongs to him. It's not yours, it's his. We are stewards of what he has given us, managers of all of his resources, both spiritual and physical. So let's look at some of these principles. Let me give some of them to you. And, and I, I was going to make this a two or three part <laughs> exposition because there's so much. But I thought, you know, I'm just going to condense it. I'll have to leave a lot of things out, but I'll give you the basics of it. First principle can be summarized this way. Giving is a planned act of worship in response to legitimate needs. I want you to look at verse 2. On the first day of every week, or if more literally in, in the Greek, it, it, it would be translated this way, Sunday by Sunday, Sunday by Sunday, let each one of you put aside and save. By the way, the implication here is that our giving needs to be planned, it needs to be systematic, and it's, and it's linked to worship on the Lord's Day. And we're going to see other passages that speak of this as well. For example, here at Calvary Bible Church, every Sunday we pass a plate. We don't have a box up here that you can put money in, and that's okay, that's a preference, but I prefer, and the elders prefer, to pass the plate so that it is a reminder, a constant reminder of our stewardship responsibility before the Lord every Sunday, and that it is a part of our worship. Our faithfulness and generosity and giving is, is directly related to our love for Christ and, 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 and our, our worship, worshiping Him with all of our being and all of our possessions. So he's saying here that each member was to give, to, to basically keep a growing amount. He says, I want you to put aside. Literally, it means I want uh, uh, it's to be kept by Him is what the Greek tells us. I want them to put it aside. In other words, I want you to deposit a specific amount in a safe and convenient place. That's the idea. Now, that was probably not the church, because the church in those days, it wasn't like it was here. They had some. They met in building types of places, but in most cases, it was in large homes. And so they didn't have a secure treasury. Uh, we do now, when you give money, the money gets counted and it goes to the bank and it's in a safe place. So Sunday by Sunday, as an act of honoring the Lord, they were to put aside, he says, and, notice, save. Save funds for this collection. Uh, save uh, thesarizo in the, the original language. It means to store up. And by the way, the noun form depicts a treasury, a storehouse, a, a place, a safekeeping place for valuables. In fact, we get our English word thesaurus from that. A thesaurus is a treasury of words, mainly synonyms and antonyms. And notice that he also directed all of the churches of Galatia concerning this collection. So he's not singling out Corinth here. All of the churches get this admonition, as well as the church at Corinth, to put aside some funds on the first day of the week, Sunday by Sunday. So from this text and from others, as we will see, giving is not to be haphazard, it's not to be whimsical, it is to be planned, systematic, regular in response to physical, spiritual needs of, of not only our own church, but others as well, other churches at large. By the way, think about this. As individuals, we, we budget for our mortgage, right? We know what our mortgage is going to require, our utilities, our car payments, our, our taxes, our retirement, whatever. But the question is, do you budget as well with your proceeds to give to the Lord out of your deep love for Him? Is that a priority? Or is that just something you just kind of put out to the side and every now and then you write a check or throw a 20 in the offering plate? Now, with respect to legitimate needs, may I say that Calvary Bible Church, we have a budget that distributes the financial gifts that come in according to the specific needs of the church, according to missions and other churches beyond our church but also the first Sunday of, of every month, which is this Sunday, you have an opportunity to give to benevolence, and we give 
uh, we take those funds and we put them in a special account. And many of you have been recipients of those funds when you have had dire need. And occasionally we collect special offerings. We will collect not just money, but food and other supplies for saints in distress. Boy, we've done this uh, in, for saints in, in Sudan and Uganda and Siberia, um, hurricane, tornado, and flood victims in various parts of, of our country. I remember I went with Mike Rutherford with a huge trailer that he had that you all filled up with goods to, for a church down in uh, Gulf Shores, Alabama, uh, when Katrina came through and just completely leveled that area. And so there are special needs that come up. And Galatians 6.10, by the way, says that we are to do good to all men, um, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. And so giving is to be a planned act of worship in response to legitimate needs. And you want to ask again, is this a priority in my life? Because God would have it so. And if not, frankly, you are living in disobedience, and you will forfeit God's blessing in your life. Frankly, you show me a Christian who does not include generous, sacrificial, regular, systematic giving as a priority of worship, and I will show you a believer who is out of fellowship with God and who is forfeiting blessing in his or her life. They will be bereft of power. The fruits of the Spirit won't be there in manifold ways and They will really have no real effectiveness in Christian service. And what you end up with, like much of what we have in the United States, is you have within the church just another freeloader with an entitlement mentality and a hundred excuses why they don't need to give anything. Well, this was Paul's concern with the saints there at Corinth, given their background. He knew they were selfish, they were self-centered, self-absorbed, self-promoting, and so forth. And frankly, the silent mantra of many people in our country, even within the ranks of evangelicalism, is basically, he who has the most toys in the end wins, right? And so we, <laughs> we build bigger houses to put all of our stuff. And then we build more outbuildings to put all of our stuff. And then we have to rent storage units to put all of our stuff. And then finally, we have to get, have garage sales to get rid of some of our stuff so we can buy more stuff and put it on credit, right, to buy more stuff. And then we turn around and we say, you know, Lord, I, I, I just don't have any money here to help you out. Well, the problem is this betrays a a selfish, even an idolatrous heart. Folks, we've got to be careful that we don't bow to the God of materialism, as is so typically the case in our culture. And frankly, amassing wealth that you're going to leave behind really doesn't make a lot of sense, you know? Well, shouldn't I take care of my family and have a retirement? Well, of course, but not at the expense of spending all of your funds on yourself and not investing in the kingdom. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So giving... a is to be a planned act of worship in response to legitimate needs. And, and frankly, uh, you, you're aware of the needs. We try to make them aware or make you aware of them when they come up. And even in our bulletin, there's always a little spot there that kind of tells you, I think there's some red ink there right now. And that, that red ink says, well, we're falling behind here in the budget. And so what do we need to do? Well, without me getting up and saying, well, uh, you need to say, you know what, Lord, there's a need. I'll help take care of this. And if everybody did that, no more need. That's how it works. Beloved, there's never a lack of resources in the church. Never. Only a lack of love for Christ. 
That's what the real issue is. God doesn't really want our money. (laughs) He wants our heart. That's why you never run a church like you run a business. Even though there are principles of business that have to be applied, the church is a spiritual organism that derives its life from its head, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a business. It's not an organization designed to make money. And think about it. God could have met all of the needs for those saints in Jerusalem, right? Just just like that. He could meet all of our needs here at Calvary Bible Church whenever they come up, right? Piece of cake. Well, why doesn't he do that? Because he wants to give us an opportunity to demonstrate our love for him. And he wants us to experience the joy of sacrificial giving. He wants us to experience the joy of humble dependency so that he can prove himself powerful on our behalf and lavish his blessings upon us. I'm convinced he keeps us in a perpetual state of need so that that he can keep us in a perpetual state of dependency. You know, it's fascinating. The two most God-honoring, faithful churches out of the seven that are mentioned in Revelation 2 and 3, the the church of uh, Philadelphia and the church at Smyrna, were the most persecuted churches and the most poverty-stricken churches. In fact, in Revelation 2, 9, regarding the church of Smyrna, the Lord says, I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but then in parenthesis, parenthesis it says, but you are rich. And Laodicea, which was the wealthiest church, and they bragged about their wealth and how they didn't need anything, <laughs> they were the church that were poor, so poor that... It made God vomit. Kind of puts it in perspective, doesn't it? Dear Christian, the the, the Lord knows our needs, and he can meet them effortlessly. But like any father, he expects, expects us to be content with what he gives us. But he also expects us to do what we can to participate so that he can lavish his blessing upon us. And so we trust him to do what he will in his good timing. So giving is a planned act of worship in response to legitimate needs. Secondly, giving is an all-inclusive responsibility. Again, notice verse 2. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save, as he may prosper, so that no collections be made when I come. Notice, each one of you. And then in parens it says, unless you're too poor, or unless you're overextended, or unless God has been, you know, unfair to you and not given you anything more than just the, the bare essentials, then, then you're exempt. Well, he doesn't say that. He wants everyone to have an opportunity to manifest their love for him, to trust in him, so that he can in turn bless them in ways that they cannot imagine. Dear Christian, don't be a fool and think that you can fool God. He knows your heart. He knows all of your lame excuses. He knows how you spend money on yourself or on frivolous things, etc., etc. He knows your spending habits. He knows that we can all give something. Remember, God doesn't want your money, he wants your heart. And where your treasure is, that proves where your heart is, right? You know, this is illustrated by the generosity of the impoverished churches of Macedonia. Macedonia, by the way, was a, was a northern Greek um, um, Roman province that was very poor um, in northern Greece. It consisted of the church of, of uh, Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea primarily. And they had been asked to participate in this as well. In fact, I read a little of that earlier. But let me read to you from 2 Corinthians 8, beginning in verse 1. He says, Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God, which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, 
they gave of their own accord. And I love this, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation and the support of the saints. In other words, they realize that giving is a privilege. It's not an obligation. It's a privilege. Hey, we want to be a part of this. He goes on to say, and this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. So they realized that giving was a privilege. It was an act of worship. And their first priority was to give themselves wholeheartedly to the Lord. When I see someone that has no interest and it's just not a priority to invest in the kingdom, I know that they're not right with the Lord. This leads us to a third set of principles, and that is giving is to be proportional, sacrificial, and voluntary. Stay right there with me in 2 Corinthians 8, 3 for a moment. It says, they gave according to their ability. In other words, giving is proportionate. There's no fixed amount. There's no percentage. It is based upon what you have. Secondly, and beyond their ability. There we see it. Giving should also be sacrificial. Knowing that God will supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 19. And then it goes on and he says, they gave of their own accord. So giving should be voluntary. Not out of compulsion, not out of manipulation, not out of intimidation. We're not going to do like the Mormons do and check your tax returns to make sure you gave 10%. We're not going to turn down all the lights and have a spotlight and a video cam so that as the plate goes along, everybody can see up here who gives what. We're not going to do that, right? Giving is to be proportional, sacrificial, and voluntary. We see the same principles in our text here in 1 Corinthians 16, 2. Each one of you is to put aside and save as he may prosper. As he may prosper, literally in the Greek, as to what the amount should be. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, I read it earlier this morning. Let each one give as he purposes in his heart. The, the, the word purposes in the original language uh, means to choose or predetermine. It, it denotes voluntary, premeditated, a premeditated plan of action from the heart. Now, I know many will say, well, I thought we're supposed to tithe. Doesn't the Bible teach we're supposed to tithe? We're supposed to give 10% of our net income. Or, as I say, others will argue, well, no, it's your gross income. Well... My response is, if that is, if 10% is proportional to what you've, you've prospered, if it is sacrificial, if that is what you have purposed in your heart, then, and, it, and it's voluntary, then that's fine. But folks, you must understand, that is not a requirement. That is not a requirement. It can be, and it certainly is, a very common amount that many people choose to give, and frankly, most people that, that choose to give 10% actually use that as just a baseline, and they end up giving much more. But Abraham gave Melchizedek 10% in Genesis 14. I, uh, Jacob promised to give a tenth of all he had if God would protect and prosper him in Genesis 28. But in both cases, their giving, catch this, was completely voluntary. It was not required. And if we go to Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 4, we see that Abraham's tithe may have only been a tenth of the best, not a tenth of the total. You see, folks, quite honestly, for most people in our culture, 10% is not sacrificial. And for others, it may be more than they can bear. But either way, God does not require us to give a specific amount anywhere in the New Testament. Because you must understand that tithing was taxation under the Mosaic law. It was taxation required to support the theocracy of Israel. From the book of Genesis to the giving of the law, all the way through the days of Jesus and beyond, uh, in the New Testament, Scripture reveals there are only two kinds of giving. I want to make this real simple. There are only two kinds of giving. Required giving and free will giving. 
Required giving is taxation. That was the tithe. And then there was free will giving. In other words, give whatever your heart desires, recognizing that it needs to be sacrificial, needs to be generous, needs to be joyful. You're going to reap what you sow, etc., etc. The Old Testament, for example, had required giving or taxation under the Mosaic Law, and it, is, it consisted basically of three different tithes that amounted to about 23% in addition to some other taxes that they paid. The first 10% supported the priests and the Levites in charge of the religious life of Israel and part of the government. It was a theocracy. The second 10% supported the social and the religious life of Israel by funding the feasts in Jerusalem and so forth. And then the third tithe was paid every third year, and that was for their social services, or you might say, their welfare system. And there were various forms of taxation, like they had a, a land Sabbath rest tax. Uh, they also had a, a special uh, profit-sharing tax, where a man could only harvest uh, certain portions of his field, leave the corners open for the poor, and so forth. But you must understand, tithing was not considered giving under the Mosaic Law. It was taxation. It was a required amount. It was not a gift. By the way, keep this in mind. You see, the tithe didn't belong to the people. It belonged to the Lord. Does that make sense? Repeatedly in the Old Testament, we, we read, the tithe is the Lord's. The tithe is the Lord's. So you can't give what already belongs to someone else. In fact, if you fail to give back to the Lord what was rightfully His, Malachi 3 says that you rob God. Remember that text? Malachi 3, beginning in verse 8. Will you rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? And here's the answer is, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. You see, folks, when the people failed to pay their taxes, their tithes, not only did they violate God's law, which was a supreme insult to the sovereign king of kings, but it disrupted the entire religious system that God had set in place. Because what happened is when there wasn't any tithe, the priests had no means of support. And so they had to abandon their priestly functions and take up farming just to survive. That's what was going on. So the whole theocracy began to fall apart. Moreover, the poor and the strangers suffered severely because their tithe included portions of their crops. It included portions of their animals. And those things were brought into this huge temple treasury that included, you know, it wasn't just a, you know, a room where they kept a bunch of money. I mean, they had massive places where they kept storehouses of food and massive places where they had animals to try to help people that were in need. And so if, if you're not paying the tithe, you're robbing God and all these things fall apart. These things were crucial supplies needed to support the temple ministry that would in turn help the needy and the stranger. So tithing was taxation under the Mosaic law and it should not be confused with the free will giving of the people, where they gave out of the goodness of their heart because they loved the Lord. In fact, in the Old Testament, free will offerings, if you study it, were always spontaneous, proportional, sacrificial, and voluntary, with no frequency, with no specific amount ever stipulated. You say, well, what about the New Testament? Well, it's very simple. The New Testament teaches the same thing. There's two types of giving. There's required giving and there's free will giving. Required giving is pay your taxes, right? It's taxation. We give to the governing authorities over us, and free will giving is what we read here. Put aside and save as he may prosper, 1 Corinthians 16, 2. 
2 Corinthians 8, 3, give according to your ability and beyond your ability. They gave of their own accord. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart. That's free will giving. Now, it's interesting in the New Testament, you realize even Jesus paid his taxes. Those of you that want to get out of your paying your taxes, because after all, those corrupt politicians, well, Jesus paid his taxes, and believe me, they were as corrupt then as they are now, if not worse. Mark 12, 17, he said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God. In Matthew 17, 25, where we read that Jesus paid his taxes. Romans 13, 1, let every person be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those which exist are established by God. In verse 4, it says, for it, referring to the government, is a minister of God to you for good. Beginning in verse 6, for because of this you also pay taxes. For rulers are servants of God, devoting themselves to these very things, render to all what is due them, tax to whom tax is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Bottom line, don't cheat on your taxes. Friends, let me put it this way. If you cheat on your taxes, you're actually cheating God. And you're going to forfeit blessing in your life. You're ultimately taking what belongs to him since he is the one who established the government that has been placed over you. All right, well then, so how much should I give? After all, some will say in Mark 12, in the story of the widow's might, she gave everything she had. Surely I'm not supposed to do that. Is that what God expects? Well, of course not. That's foolish. By the way, just as a footnote, be very careful not to impose some lesson on giving from that particular text. While it's common to do so, such an interpretation is utterly foreign to the narrative. If you go to that passage, and I'll do it just briefly, the context is, of that story is a warning of judgment upon the corrupt uh, leaders of Israel who were deceiving widows with false promises that were consistent with Jewish legalism. Basically what they were saying is, the more you give, the more you're going to get. I mean, it was, it was their variation of a prosperity gospel back then. I mean, Satan has used that garbage for, you know, for millennia. It was their version of the word faith movement. But if you look at that, that passage, that passage, there is no indication in Jesus' story that that woman even loved him, that she was a believer, no indication whatsoever. There's no mention of the attitude of her heart. There's no commendation for the amount she gave. There's no mention of any principle for giving in the whole story. But what is clear is that she was another victim duped by the greedy religionists that God was condemning because they were nothing more than religious predators. They were greedy phonies that were willing to take her last cent, like other widows as well, and leave them utterly destitute. So don't use the story of the widow's might as a lesson on stewardship. By the way, if you all did that, boy, we would all be in a world of hurt, right? Well, let's just give everything, and then, you know, it's crazy. So how can I discern the will of God when it comes to giving? How much should I give? I love what Augustine said. He put it so simply regarding how you discern the will of God. He says it's real simple. Love God and do what you want. The hard part is loving God. But if you truly love God, you're going to want to do what God would have you do. And so practically speaking, we are to give sacrificially. We are to give in proportion to what we have out of our love for him, out of a desire to invest in the kingdom. Because we know we cannot outgive God. Beloved, giving to God is an investment that is guaranteed to pay not only enormous returns, but eternal returns. Remember again what I read earlier. Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Instead, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And you know, as I think about it, I am not going to make massive investments here in this short life on things that pay no eternal dividend. Right? I'm just not going to do that. That's kind of stupid. 
I'm not going to invest on the things of, of this earth and constantly be worrying about the stock market and an and economic recession or somebody stealing my money, and we probably all had that happen. I, I'm, I'm going to invest in the kingdom because I know the king personally, and I love the king. The king gave himself for me. He's coming again for me. I'm going to spend eternal, eternity in the kingdom. That's where I'm going to put my money. Well, yes, but shouldn't we save, for the, save and prepare for the future? Well, of course. But not if in saving you become obsessed with the accumulation of wealth and you spend it on all these extravagant things that you're not going to take with you. you know, child of God, live in light of eternal glory and not in light of, the, of, 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 of this fleeting life on this fallen earth. Trust God to meet your basic needs. And even beyond that, I, I think of what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 25. He goes on and he says, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. But they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, being worried, could add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow, and they do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And folks, remember, again, you just simply cannot outgive God. Remember what I read earlier in 2 Corinthians 9, just in verse 5 and following, he says, So I thought it necessary to urge the brethren that they would go on ahead to you and arrange beforehand your previously promised bountiful gift so that the same would be ready as a bountiful gift and not affected by covetousness. And then he says this, Now this I say, He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And then I love what he says here. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Boy, we could all give our testimonies to that, right? Now, this doesn't mean that if you sow money, you're going to reap more money. All right? A lot of people think that. Well, God, here's a 20. You know, I'm expecting at least, you know, 25, 30, maybe 40. No, that, that, that's not what he's saying here. You see, God's blessings will come in many different forms. God knows exactly what we need and when we need it. Let me put it to you this way. If, God forbid, the sheriff knocks on your door and tells you that your loved ones have just been killed in a car accident, you're not going to cry out to the Lord and say, Lord, right now I need more money. You're going to need something else. And he will provide that. His all-sufficient grace to sustain you in the moment. You're going to reap what you've sown. And when your children come to faith in Christ and they walk in loving obedience, you're not going to say, Lord, this is really great. I'm really thankful for this. But what I really wish I had is more money. See how silly it gets? So... We really need to realize again that God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. 
So giving is a planned act of worship in response to legitimate needs. It's an all-inclusive responsibility. It is to be proportional, sacrificial, and voluntary. And frankly, there's no better way to distinguish a mature believer from an immature believer than in their worship of giving. And I want to close with a quote from the second century Athenian statesman, statesman Aristides. I love it when non-believers give testimony about believers that are accurate and that are good. Don't you love that? And this is one of those. I put it in your bulletin. I think, I think it's in your bulletin. By the way, I believe what he wrote here could be a testimony of the people at Calvary Bible Church. Here's what he said. These Christians, they walk in all humility and kindness, and falsehood is not found among them, and they love one another. They despise not the widow, or grieve not the orphan. He that hath distributeth liberally to him that hath not. If they see a stranger, they bring him under their roof and rejoice over him as if, as, as, as if it were their own brother. For they call themselves brethren, not after the flesh, but after the Spirit and in God. But when one of their poor passes away from the world and any of them see him, then he provides for his burial according to his ability. And if they hear that any of their number is imprisoned or oppressed for the name of their Messiah, all of them provide for his needs. And if it is possible he may be delivered, they deliver him. And if there is a man among them that is poor and needy, and they have not among them an abundance of necessaries, they fast two or three days that they may supply the needy with their necessary food. End quote. What an amazing testimony. A testimony of God's grace in the lives of his people. Well, may I challenge you to examine yourself in light of these great principles. Proverbs 3, I don't have this for you on the overhead, but beginning in verse 9, it says, Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce, so your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. And Proverbs 11, verse 25 says, The generous man will be prosperous, and he who waters will himself be watered. Folks, invest in the kingdom. Do it out of desire, not out of duty, because of your love for Christ. So bountifully that you might reap bountifully. Not just material things, but all of the spiritual things that are far more, far more important. And do it because you love your King who purchased you with His very blood. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for the eternal truths of Your Word. I pray that they are clear, that they are convicting, that they are comforting. And I pray that all of us will take them to heart and be obedient to what you would have us understand with respect to our finances and our giving. Thank you for the way you have just lavished your blessings upon us, not just materially, but spiritually. And as always, we are humbly dependent upon you for our every need. And we thank you that you know our needs even before we do. And so we trust you completely to care for us because we belong to you as your precious adopted children. So we thank you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray you've been edified by this presentation. You've been listening to the teaching ministry of Calvary Bible Church in Jolton, Tennessee. For more information on Calvary Bible Church or for more audio, please visit our website at cbctn.org.